Welcome to episode 125 of the Headspace and Timing Podcast. On today's show, I have a conversation with Dr. Janelle McCauley, a retired Air Force officer and combat veteran with over 3,000 flying hours on various types of aircraft. Dr. McCauley has done numerous things after her service, including serving as a human performance consultant for a number of organizations. Her advanced degrees are in the area of kinesiology and strategic health and human performance, and she recognizes the need for leadership in the mental health space as well as the personal performance space. I just wish that more leaders would create their cultures around being okay to ask for help and using these types of what would be considered, and I'm using air quotes, unconventional leadership skill sets to kind of create the thread of who they are as individuals and then kind of how you seamlessly integrate that into your leadership style to give other people the okay to go see the chiropractor even or the mental health counselors or to start meditating. We just need more, I think, brave people to stand up and start talking about it openly. Welcome to the Headspace and Timing Podcast, a show dedicated to breaking down the stereotypes around veteran mental health. My name is Dwayne France, and I'm a retired Army non-commissioned officer and a combat veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan. After retiring from the Army, I took on a new mission as a clinical mental health counselor for my fellow service members. If you served in any branch of the military, then you're familiar with the M2 machine gun, the 50 cal. It's one of the most effective weapons in the military's arsenal. If the weapon's headspace and timing wasn't set correctly, however, it was just a useless chunk of metal. Veterans can be rendered inoperable if their headspace and timing is not set correctly either. That's my goal with this show, to change the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health and reduce the stigma against seeking support. Each week, we'll talk with mental health professionals, veterans, and those who support service members, veterans, and their families. We're going to have real and honest conversations about a topic that most just don't like to talk about, veteran mental health. Let's jump into this week's conversation. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Headspace and Timing Podcast. Once again, and as always, we really appreciate you taking the time to listen and learn more about veteran mental health. Uh, my guest today is a uh, a decorated Air Force officer, um, Dr. Janelle McCauley. Uh, Dr. McCauley had a 20-year Air Force career um, and is now doing a lot of things in the wellness space, and, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation she and I are going to have today. Janelle, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you. Yeah, I'm excited to to have you on. Um, like I said, I've been uh, looking through some of the stuff that you've been posting, and um, and, it, and it, a lot of it is about strength and resilience, and and focusing on a positive mindset in post military life. Before we get into all that, though, I want to give you an opportunity to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and um, sort of how you got to this space. Definitely. Well, I grew up in a family of public servants in Southern California. My uncle and both my grandfathers were in the Marine Corps. So there was a very Marine heavy influence on my childhood. My mom was a nurse and my dad was a police officer. And so I think I always knew I would serve my community in some way in the future, just wasn't sure kind of as I was growing up where that would lead to. Um, Kind of an interesting story. And I, I, I talk a little bit about it in my TED talk. You know, when I was a little kid, um, my dad would tell anyone that would listen that I was going to grow up to be a combat pilot or a submarine warfare commander. And this was in the 1980s when those jobs weren't even available to women. And, you know, it didn't really matter. When I grew up, I just kind of had this sense of, you know, I could do or be anything I wanted if I had enough drive and hard work. And that's kind of what my dad instilled in me. You know, I didn't understand society had put barriers on my potential as a female. And so that was, that was very powerful. Um, I ended up you know, kind of going toward the combat pilot uh, realm instead of the the Navy and Marines. Although I will I will say, having the family of Marines, they actually did kind of guide me a little bit more toward the Air Force. Um, when my uncle would tell me some of his stories about uh, hot bunking it on Navy ships um, versus the the air conditioned billets that most of the Air Force people would live in. Uh, that was definitely compelling. Um, and at the time there were a lot more, you know, the, in the nineties, a lot more pilot training slots 
going the Air Force route. So that was another reason why I went that way. Um, but I went to the Air Force Academy, had, you know, a unique experience four years there in Colorado Springs and did uh, attain my goal of, of being a pilot. And so then I spent most of my 20 year military career flying different planes. Sometimes I feel felt as if the Air Force, you know, I couldn't keep a, a job. They kept kind of rotating me around in uh, different areas of the organization, both as a leader, as an academic, and then as a pilot uh, kind of flying three different aircraft. So I flew Learjets, uh, distinguished visitor, um, and VIP travel through most of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And then I flew C-130 combat tactical airlifters and then KC-10 tankers. Um, across that, I also went back to school quite a few times and ended up with a master's degree in exercise physiology. And that was really, that bore out of my initial interest in kind of how the human body worked, how, you know, we could use physical fitness um, to benefit our professional lives. So I kind of have always had that a little bit of passion for that area of ex expertise and study. And then when I was able to get my doctorate um, in strategy, I kind of wanted to take that idea of, you know, wellness and then pair it with how we can look at us, our the human body and the human weapon system really from a strategic health perspective. So that's where I dove in to kind of my latest research and, and academic sphere. And then, you know, I took those skill sets and used them as a commander in the Air Force when I led a unit, an operational unit of 400 civilians. There were actually soldiers as well in my unit and civil um civilians, airmen, and uh, sailors. So I used my wellness skill sets in meditation, human performance, and we built a human performance center. We used mindfulness as a key skill set and leadership tool. Um, so it was not just the physical aspect, but the mental aspect. And then since then, I've just kind of been talking about my experience, my research, and continuing the work, especially to help military members from a prevention and performance aspect, and then also veterans in their transition uh, to the civilian world. Yeah, that's great. And, and there's definitely a lot there. You know, how do we sum up a quarter century in, in about five minutes? Um, it, it, but even going back, and it was it was really um, interesting to hear your father speaking into you those things and giving you that confidence. Um, and we know that the opposite also happens, right? You know, if we are told as children that you're not going to be, a, you know, crush the dream of being a, a combat pilot. No, you know, that that doesn't happen, right? You know, they don't allow women on submarines um, that even as children, what we're told becomes our truth. Oh, exactly. Exactly. I'm a big believer in that idea of growth mindset. And if, you know, I was always kind of, no matter what it was, whether it was academics or athletics, I'd like to think that, you know, this is even before a lot of the research by Carol Dweck kind of has come out uh, to talk about the messaging we use, not only with our children, but with ourselves as we're kind of developing our skill sets. It's very powerful. And, you know, I think my parents did a pretty good job of focusing more on the process of things instead of just the outcomes. And, you know, uh, Kobe Bryant has this great speech where he talks about protecting your dream. And I love this little film clip because he talks, he, his main, you know, focus is that don't let other people, right, tell you that your dream is, is not, there's no potential for it or, you know, shut it down or because that negative dialogue really will get inside and it, you won't live the truth and the dream that, that you want. Um, and so I really like that idea of always remembering to protect your dream, right? If you don't protect it, nobody else will. And, um, so it's that messaging you use with yourself, um, it, that can be very powerful and, and how you kind of define success in the future. Right. This, this idea of, either I can or I can't, those voices that are in our head, those aren't our voices. Other people put those voices there. You know, when, when you were three years old, you didn't think I can't do something. And we just didn't have that level of understanding. Um, and, and so your father's saying, well, you can do this. You, if you want to do this and, uh, 
a little jealous it was the Navy and the Air Force, and he didn't say you could be a you know a, a tank commander or something like that. Um, but but this idea of you can that was placed in in your mind, right? That's your father's voice who who did that, and then of course you made it your own. In those negative voices that are placed in our head, we they become our own voices too. Um, and then this takes you on. I've I've had the and it literally is an honor um, that I've been able to. Uh, conduct a, a service academy nomination um, committee uh, for the last couple of years for one of our local senators. Um, it's very challenging to get into the service academies, not just the Air Force Academy, but all this. I mean, it's, you know, as, as well as I do. Um, and, and then I've had the honor of knowing some of the cadets and everybody wants to be a pilot, right? Everybody who goes in the Air Force Academy thinks they're going to be a pilot. Um, and, and so, you did though, right? And, and you you were able to kind of meet those criteria, and a lot of that I think had to do with this "I can and I will" mindset. Oh, exactly. Yes, and I think that has served me well even throughout most of my military career. You know, I, I get a lot of individuals that kind of reach out and want to say, "Oh, I want to model my career after you," or or do something similar. And my first, you know, bit of mentorship I give most people is that everyone needs to kind of chart their own path you know, and, and never just say, okay, I'm going to repeat what someone else did. You know, we all have kind of the, our own way that our passions can kind of meet with our, the opportunities that we have in our life. But the one thing I always tell individuals is that, you know, let, don't let no be an obstacle, right? Because it's through those obstacles that you actually get to where you're truly meant to be and your full potential as a human being. And so just use the no, not as kind of a brick wall, um, but, you know, trying to find where the window or the door is, you know, uh, in that obstacle, because there's another one there. And so I think that's really what, when my dad kind of gave me this powerful messaging, you know, and self messaging that I had for myself, that I can do the things that I set out to do. I've always just looked for a different way to get to yes. And it may not have been the one that I expected. And I have had many disappointments in my life because I thought that this was the one way I was going to get to my dreams or my goals. And sometimes it it just takes a, a different path and um, you have to be accepting of that. I mean, my freshman year at the academy, I broke my femur and they put a metal rod and four screws in my leg in order to you know, for the healing process. And I was initially told you will never fly with all that metal in your leg. And so imagine that, like I went to the Academy to be a pilot and within the first few months there, I break my femur metal in my leg and am now being told that that dream is over. Um, and obviously I didn't let that stop me. So I found another way to get to the end goal that I wanted. And so that's kind of, I think, something that we have to remind ourselves is that the disappointments and setbacks don't always mean that that dream is finished. It may just take a different form. Yeah, this is something that I hear often with the veterans that I work with is this idea of, you know, I can't or I won't be able to, as we place these barriers um, in our own way, right? You know, these, these obstacles, I like this idea that, you know, we have to you know, through these obstacles, many veterans and, and arguably, you know, you know, definitely me and, and probably you throughout your life, it, the no is, is a legitimate no, right? It is a, an actual no, this is not the way that you want to go uh, or that you're going to be able to go. But a lot of us just simply accept the no and, and just kind of shrug and, and turn around and go the other way. Um, and in that way, limit not just our potential for things that we can do, but our own potential for life satisfaction. Definitely. Um, I, I completely agree. And I, and I think that when you adapt this more growth mindset uh, mentality, and especially as parents and spouses, we have to be careful, you know, what kind of messaging we're using with the people in our families and the examples we're setting, you know, um, I, like to make sure that my children understand that failure and obstacles and barriers sometime, well, they're, they're, we're not going to, first of all, that they exist, right? We're not going to live this life without them. Um, and so it's how you find uh, your own path and, and journey through the process of growth and learning and change. And all of that requires those challenges and those barriers and those fears to kind of exist. And so not to be afraid of that part of the process, but actually embrace it because that's what makes you a better person in the end. 
Um, but a lot of us don't uh, think about it in those terms. It's a reframing of the way we see those disappointments and challenges. Hey, you've mentioned a couple times this idea of the growth mindset in, in Dr. Carol Dweck, um, and, and I am familiar um, uh, but maybe if you could uh, give a little bit of an explanation about the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset in, in what you know about um, sort of uh, Dr. Dweck's work. Right. One of the greatest ways I or the easiest ways to kind of explain the concept um, the, in the book. Uh, switch, which is by the Heath brothers. And I, 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 I might throw out a few book recommendations as we go. I do like to recommend books. I'm an avid, an avid reader, but I really enjoyed, um, in the book switch, they talked about kind of breaking it down in, in its simplest terms. So when you were a kid, if you were really good at something like soccer and your parents told you from a young age that you are such a great soccer player, man, when you're out there on the field, you are the best soccer player we've ever seen. You're so amazing at soccer. Then that individual becomes kind of fixed in their identity of who they are. And they start thinking, I'm a soccer player. Now, they may very well be, and that could be a, a valid label for them. However, the, the danger is that then it becomes the only label. And so say that same individual gets asked one day to try something like salsa dancing and they try it and they're not very good at salsa dancing. And so they immediately excuse it by saying, well, it's because I'm a soccer player. I'm not a salsa dancer. And so they never try it again, right? They get very uncomfortable set, stepping outside of where their natural skill sets lie. Now, we all kind of have an ability to learn, to grow, to get better at things, right? We may never be Pele or an amazing soccer player, but if we if we knew as a kid, hey, when we work hard and our, and our parents used the type of verbiage um, and messaging and saying, hey, when you work really hard and then you're out there on the soccer field, look at what happens. Your team wins or you score goals or when you don't practice as much, right? Like you you didn't win in that tournament and you kind of focus more on the effort and the process versus just the outcomes. And so then when that same individual one day goes and tries something like salsa dancing and they're not good at it at first, they don't immediately think, well, it's because I'm a soccer player. They think, but I know I can get good at things when I put some effort and work behind them so I can get good at salsa dancing, too. And so, you know, I think we have a problem in today's society with a lot of fixed mindset, with a lot of fixed identities, especially in leaders. And when you have a leader like that, you tend to walk on eggshells. They tend to be very intimidated and threatened by individuals um, who may put their leadership right at risk because they get defined by I'm a leader because that's my position, not focused on I'm a leader and I'm training other leaders below me. Um, so I think it can also affect not only our individual growth, but if those individuals with fixed mindsets become leaders, it can harm organizational development. Yeah, I can see there's an idea of a, a fixed organizational growth. We're not going to go into that space because that's not what we do, right? We're, we're not going to, uh, as a mental health professional, why would I do a podcast? I'm not a podcaster, right? I mean, this is one of the things that I'm I'm definitely experiencing um, is that in the mental health profession, we're not communicating the way that, that we likely know that we could or should. Um, but this idea of the fixed mindset, um, and I really appreciate it was a very positive example um, I am, I am not a natural optimist. I have to work at it. Um, hearing you, this idea of if someone has said, um, you're a loser your entire life, again, this is putting that negative, um, uh, voice into their head. And then they try salsa dancing. They say, well, of course I'm not good at it because I'm a loser. They get stuck in this, this loser mindset or, or this negative mindset. Um, and I see this a lot with veterans to say, well, I'm, I'm a combat veteran. Of course I am whatever stereotype, right? You know, of course, people are afraid of me. Of course, this, of course, that, because we get stuck in this mindset, um, you can get fixed in a negative mindset just as well as you can sort of get fixed in something that may be positive, like a soccer player. 
Exactly. Exactly. It works the same way. And I think a lot of the most recent research into things like optimism and gratitude would tell us that we can train our minds to think differently. Like there are things we can do to swap from a like negative fixed mindset more to a growth mindset. We can do things to, to change from having that pessimistic out, outlook into one that's more optimistic. Um, but it has to do with what I would define as mental fitness and mental exercises. And right now that's very stigmatized. You know, nobody would think twice if I said, Hey, I'm going to, you know, after this podcast, I'm going to go to the gym and do some push ups because I need to, you know, work on my physical fitness and my strength. Okay. Totally. That makes sense. But if I were to say, Hey, after this podcast, I'm going to do my mental push ups to, to strengthen my mind. It still sounds a little bit funny and like, what does she mean? Mental push-ups, And, you know, does that, does that mean she's somehow messed up in the mind? So she needs to do something mm -hmm. to fix it. Um, versus the physical aspect, we don't really see it that way. We see it as performance based and prevention based to help our physical health in the future. Yet we don't understand that mental push-ups help our shape, our mindset and our mental health for the future. Right. If if you were to say, or if I were to say, you know, after this podcast, um, you know, I'm going to see my therapist, I'm going to see my counselor, I'm going to see, um, or, or even, you know, a spiritual counselor, something like that, right? If, um, if, if you say that, then people are like, well, there must be something wrong for you to go to that person. Um, although if we said, I'm going to my physical therapist, or I'm going to my chiropractor, they would say, okay, there's something wrong, but it wouldn't have the negative stigma, right? There's like, oh, they're improving themselves um, in such a way. But if you want to go say, I'm, I'm going to see my phys uh, my personal trainer versus my psychological trainer, let's so to speak. Um, but if I'm going to my physical trainer, they'd be like, well, good for you. And it goes into something we were talking about earlier is when I say the word veteran mental health, and I deliberately choose those words because of rose by any other name, you know, we don't call cancer, not cancer. It, it is what it is. Um, but when we say, veteran mental health, people automatically go to the idea of PTSD and, and suicide. But when we say physical health, we don't automatically go to cancer or diabetes and things like that. And so um, I really appreciate your efforts and really changing the way. And again, this is that reframing mindset, but changing the way that we're thinking about mental fitness from a wellness perspective and not an illness perspective. Exactly. And I think most you know, veterans that I speak with and I work with to include myself, uh, across our journey, especially for me over the last 20 years, spending, spending time in the military around year 13, I really had a breaking point. And that's usually what happens between like the 10 to 15 year range is that we realize that the drive and the hard work and the training and just kind of gutting it out right? Both physically and mentally that we've been doing from our, you know, our teens and our twenties, like there comes a point when we're, we're broken, you know, across the life cycle of any military member, if we don't start from the beginning and instilling the practices of learning how to both take care of ourselves, right? The self-care. And I use the oxygen mask anal analogy all the time. You know, we know in, in an airplane emergency, you secure your oxygen mask before you help anyone else, right? Because if you don't have oxygen, then you're not going to be good to anyone else. You can't serve and lead others to the best of your, your ability. So I use that same analogy. We need to provide the self-care so that we can better serve and lead um, our communities and ourselves. And I think that that's a very hard concept for, for people to learn because we're, we're so used to being sympathetically, and I mean the sympathetic nervous system, right? Sympathetically activated from day one of joining the military. And so we run on adrenaline and we run on this activated state of hyper awareness, right? We're heightened in, in, in our awareness of our environment, which is very necessary when we're doing operational and combat jobs. The problem is, is that we're never taught how to use and embrace the parasympathetic side. And that is vitally necessary for our restoration, our recovery, our overall wellness, our mental health. And so by the, you know, the 10 to 15 year point, you, you can only go so long. 
you know, sympathetically engaged. And so I think that's why we have that middle level of military members, especially, you know, and near the end of the, the uh, life cycle uh, where we're broken physically and mentally because we never were taught how to do things right from the beginning. So that's really where a lot of my work um, focuses on. It also, you know, when you have a veteran that leaves around the 10 to 13 year point, now this sympathetically activated individual is then put into civilian society. And that is a very difficult transition. That's where we have a lot of those issues where they go, they go find and seek out that uh, adrenaline and that sympathetic activation because they're not getting it anymore from a combat zone. So it manifests itself in maybe substance abuse or high risk behaviors. And um, that's never a healthy place for our veterans to be. You know, I really appreciate that the the uh, it, because a lot of this is not just psychological; it's physiological, it's biological. The idea of our uh, sympathetic nervous system, um, which acts in opposite to our parasympathetic nervous system. So, if our sympathetic nervous system is at a high rate, our parasympathetic nervous system, the calming aspect that that is very low. Uh, and you're right; we're, we're not taught; we're actually taught the opposite of these things. Um, as you were talking, it, it put me in mind, um, I got hurt in a jump in, uh, um, an airborne jump in October, 2012, um, deployed on that injury, jumped out of an airplane twice more on that injury, just to make sure that I, you know, locked it in well and good, <laughs> right. Just because that's, because that's what we do, right. That's, that's what military service members do. Um, heard a story about somebody that broke a femur in, in uh, Air Force Academy and still went on to push through, right? You know, and, and so there's limits to it. Of course, you weren't 39 when that happened. Um, <laughs> in, and so there is this, we're, we're taught different things in the military. We're taught to drive and we're taught to push. But something that, that it's interesting because you, you joined the Air Force uh, in the early to mid 90s, this, this 12 to 13 year mark, it was a huge shift in your career and my career because I, I joined in, in 93. Um, this idea of uh, and nine eleven changed everything, and nine eleven really did. I, I assume it happened probably around mid career or, or something like that for you. Yeah, it was. Well, it was shortly after I started operational flying that we we had nine eleven. But I was in, you know, before that enough or long enough to realize that it was just a different pace. Um, I think part of the issue we're having right now with our military service members is that, you know, most of us were told after 9-11, we're surging, right? This country's at war. We are going to ask more of you. We're going to have to do more. And most of us, I know from my perspective, we're a little excited about that because, you know, you didn't want to just train. I didn't join the military to fly around the flagpole, right? Like, I joined the military to contribute to a greater purpose, to have a bigger mission, to be a part of something bigger than myself. And when I deployed, I, I got that, you know, that sense really fulfilled. Um, you know, I told you I grew up, you know, with this idea of wanting to serve. And so I felt like I was serving and I was doing something. However, I think what that really has meant across the life cycle of all of our warriors is that how long are we surging, right? Like when you get your mindset wrapped around, okay, a surge where I'm going to do this, I'm in, but then there's no end in sight. Um, and you know, where is kind of the strategic vision for where all of this effort is going? Um, what, you know, like that I think can be very, uh, damaging to some people's mindset and psyche when you're, when you're in it. And again, sympathetically activated, I can do that. I know how to do that. I've been trained to do that, but how long am I going to be required, uh, to do it? And, um, without really being given the skill sets to find the right way to kind of, and I don't like to use the word balance. I usually prefer the word harmony, right? Like how do I harmonize my professional and combat life with that of also being a wife and a mother and, you know, the stress of just normal everyday life that we encounter. You know, I, I definitely appreciate looking at that, this idea of sustained surge, um, e even in each of us individually, um, physiologically, we cannot sustain extreme emotion, right? We, you can't 
be in a rage for nine hours, right? Physiologically, your, your body's or ecstasy or terror or, or whatever the, the extremist level of our emotions are physiologically, our body is not going to continue to do that. Um, but this idea of psychologically, we do tend to continue to to sort of operate at this high up high op tempo level, um, all the way up until when we leave, right? All the way up until we get out of the military, uh, and, and I often describe it as you're going from you know zero to sixty is fun, right? It's that rapid acceleration, but going from sixty to zero is not fun at all. And after this really high surge pace. And then service members get out and now they're on the dirt path slow lane. Um, it's a pretty big shock if they don't prepare for it. Exactly. I know that in my own transition, um, you know, knowing all I know, and, and like I said, around the 13 year point is when I kind of went back to school and I started really studying and looking into these concepts because I really sat there. I was at Air Command and Staff College and I was burnt out. I was miserable. You know, I kind of mention it in my t TED talk, like I was really in this space where I forgot how to laugh. Um, I lost sight of the love around me. I, I just, I couldn't see it. I had a daughter, I had a husband, but I focused more on the negative and the, the pessimism in my life. Um, I lost sight of the fact that I didn't have to be perfect at everything. Like I was so busy trying to be perfect. I didn't see that imperfection is the path to learning and growth. And so um, that's when I, I really just sat there and said, there's got to be a better way to do life. There's got to be a better way to handle the stress and the pressure that is put on us as individuals and so that we can still succeed in a sustainable way, right? I wanted to be a high performer. Most of us in the military want to be badass human weapon systems, right? Like that's what we want to be. But sometimes we sacrifice, you know, our harmony, our ability to slow down and kind of see all that life has to offer because we're so focused on just being that go, 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 high performing um, badass. But there's a limit, right? I, I, I think most of us, there's a limit to where, how far we can do that before, you know, we, we hit those burnout points. Um, and part of it is culture, right? Like it's the military culture. And this is what a lot of my work um, goes toward. And I know we're, we're not focused on organizations here, but just to kind of, you know, there's this, this new idea about what burnout means. Is it an individual because the individual doesn't have these tools to kind of take deep breaths and meditate and do all these you know, self-care things, which I think is a part of it. But the second part is the culture that you're inside of, right? We kind of tell people, well, it's your fault that you're burning out because you're not taking care of yourself. Well, that's one part of the equation. You also have to look at the environment and the, the culture that that individual is operating in. Cause you could be the most Zen self-care focused person, but still get to a burnout point because of uh, the environment around you. And and some of the, the cultural aspects, especially what we do in the military, right? We're all about five meter targets, right? Every day is a crisis um, instead of really truly thinking about the strategic vision. And I, and I myself, when I had my transition in retirement, um, even with all the self-care I had, it was a hard transition for me. I was like, we're, wait, I need some pressure, right? Like I need a deadline. I need a boss yelling down my back. I need to answer emails. And then I kind of realized, hey, no, I don't. <laughs> Right. Like this is um, but it, it kind of took my mindset to kind of really flip and shape and reframe. Um, otherwise, I would have started to, to just dive into my next career full force and say, well, no, no, no. I, I know I retired to spend more time with my kids, but I got to keep up with this high pressure, high stress world that I'm used to. No, and that's, uh, I recognize the same happened to me, this idea of, I knew that I was going to have a lot of space in my life. And even at that time, uh, I was already in my master's degree and, and I had actually even started um, uh, clinical counseling in, in that last year before I retired. So like you, I was familiar with all this stuff um, and and I was you know, maybe not terrified, but I was definitely concerned about the space I was going to have in my life. And I started putting everything on my plate and I'm probably in that third cycle of everything. Now I'm going to take it off my plate. Now I'm bored and, and, and trying to find this harmony. I, you know, perhaps like you, um, I have a congenital birth defect against saying no to opportunities. Right. And, 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 and a lot of it is you said is, is coming from a service oriented place because we want to continue to serve after the military, we want to continue to serve others, um, and, and that's what you're doing now is, is you're really trying to take these concepts about 
um, wellness and, and mental fitness um, and, and establishing a, um, a method of thinking that will help service members, veterans and, and their families in, in growth in the future? Yes, definitely. That's where I focus most of my my work today. I hope to, you know, kind of pay it forward. Um, and what I learned, I wish I had learned a lot of these things way in the beginning. And so that's um, what I try to help commanders and individuals, both in the veteran population and the active duty military, hopefully learn these skill sets. And, you know, the one word I like to, I harp on a lot is awareness. You know, for many of us, you know, especially as leaders, we are not even aware of how our actions, how stress affects us and how that actually then is put on the people who work for us, the people around us and our families, um, and how that affects our connection and our relationships. And then ultimately our performance as individuals and organizations. And so awareness is kind of the first step. Right. We kind of have to um, become aware that we need resources. Right. And then what resources are there and then how to incorporate them into our, our daily lives. Because for most of us, we and I know this was my issue for many years. It was just I didn't know that there was something wrong. Like I thought that this is the way life is and this is what the military is about. It is. It's go, go, go. And, you know, if I slow down, I'm somehow showing a weakness, right? And I like to tell people that mental skills and this idea of training our mindset is a, it seems like a soft skill from the outside, but it is really hard and it takes dedication and effort and focus and a commitment um, to kind of like embracing a new way of looking at how we can shape our mind and exercise both our physical and our mental capacities um, to put ourselves on a path to sustainable high performance in the future. And it's not going to make us lose our edge. It's what's going to give us the cutting edge in the future. Yeah, I certainly agree. I think in, in, I always start every time I, I work with a, a, a veteran for the first time and it has to start with awareness, you know, something brought to their awareness that they needed to come see me. Um, and unfortunately many times I, as a therapist, um, it's either, you know, imminently crisis during crisis or after crisis, right? So this idea of let's get ahead of the crisis and prevent them from happening. Um, but the awareness is key um, in our relationships within ourselves, you know, this emotion that I'm feeling, is it depression or is it anxiety? I, you know, just the awareness of, of what that is. Um, but then, you know, in the military, we had that awareness, right? We, we talk about while you're in combat, situational awareness, right? This hypervigilance is not pathological when you're in combat. It's, it's actually, um, protective, um, you know, I often use, and, and before we started talking, talk about mindfulness, but, um, I use the, the weapons range, um, you know, qualifying with your weapon to demonstrate mindfulness, because when you're on the range, you don't think about, um, breakfast or you don't think about, you know, your problems later that day. Um, you're, you're thinking about your breathing. You're thinking about your, um, you're thinking about your, um, position and things like that. Um, and so the awareness piece is there in the military, but a lot of times service members lose awareness of the need for awareness. Does that make sense? Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And I think many of us don't realize the pathway to get there is, you know, mindfulness. That is one of the key aspects of it is it increases your ability to bring awareness into the present moment, into what you're actually doing, into what's going on in front of you, instead of being stuck inside our heads, right? Because that's, I think, where that awareness trap, um, we think we're aware because we're listening to what's going on inside our heads, right? The stories that we create, the dialogue, the inner dialogue, um, you know, the latest statistics and really how our mind is mentally hijacked by our thoughts and feelings and emotions is something like almost 50%, right? I think it's like 46.9% of our waking moments were mind wandering and distracted. And it's like, uh, I like to teach that if you think about your attention system, right? So our system of attention is like a flashlight. It can be laser focused at what's going on right in our uh, 
most prominent in our conscious experience, right? So what's going on in front of us can also be laser focused internally at those thoughts and feelings and emotions and stories. And if you think about that at face value, almost half of your waking moments, your attention system is inward. And it's thinking about your worries, right? Like I like to say it, it catastrophizes about the things that could happen in the future. And the majority of the time, the catastrophes that we experience are the ones only in our heads, right? They actually don't happen in real life, but we create them. Uh, we also mind wander about our regrets, or what happened yesterday. And if you don't have what I, I kind of call a healthy reset every morning, kind of like a a routine that you get in before you get out of bed, um, the immediate thing you're going to start thinking about are your worries, um, your regrets, your stressors, the overwhelm you feel. And that's really not a positive place for any of us to start our day because it's going to linger with us. So mindfulness actually has been found to decrease the amount of time we spend mind wandering in those negative spaces. Because really when you're in the moment, um, there's so much that's happening right in front of us that normal, normally we mind wander through. Like I kind of uh, allude to my TED talk as well. Like I, I was mind wandering through the laughter and I was mind wandering through the love in my life. I was mind wandering through the learning opportunities because all I was focusing on was the laboring and the hard work. Like, did I work hard today? Did I, you know, get through all these stressors and five meter targets? And that's no way to live, especially in a sustainable way. Yeah, this idea of of mind wandering, you know, we're we're never in the present, we're always in the past or in the future where we came from or where we're going or things that happened 2 weeks ago or things happening 2 weeks from now. Um and and wherever we're at in this task is is okay, I'm doing this now and then um but I'm also thinking about what's the next step and what's the next step. Um and I think for service members that's natural and that's especially if we were in a, a combat environment, um it was sort of this uh, this dual attention, what am I focusing on now and what is the next step because I need to think three steps ahead of whatever I'm doing. Um but that's a mindset that doesn't necessarily it, it works well on the battlefield but not the grocery store. Right. Right. And our bodies, when we're chronically stressed, can't tell the difference. You know, we we have a um, ancient brain, right, like uh, that's really anchored in the amygdala and our emotional center um, that lives in a modern world. And so trying to figure out how to adapt that with the stressors we have in our everyday lives um, can be very complicated for a lot of individuals. I think especially today when you add on. You know, when I, back when I went to the Air Force Academy, we didn't have social media and we didn't all have cell phones. And I mean, literally, my computer was, you know, as big as this table that I'm working on right now. Right. And so it's a different world today when we have information at our fingertips, when we have overload. Right. There's no more work rest cycles. We work 24 seven constantly with uh, people expecting us to engage and respond um, without a break. And that is very unhealthy for the way we're kind of developing as, as from, you know, children up and then also uh, as adults. But it's the problem is, is that a, a like on a Facebook page gives you a dopamine response. That's kind of equi equivalent to being like an alcoholic or a drug addict. Right. So people get addicted to this false sense of connection we get from our digital devices. And so I think that's the, comp the, the complex environment we live in today because we can't escape them, right? Like it's unrealistic to be like, just never use your phone ever and never stay connected to anyone uh, digitally. Like that's an unrealistic expectation. So it's how do we develop healthy relationships and set limits um, so that we can, you know, and have an awareness about the dangers of what our phones can do to our mindset and our ability to stay focused. Right. And this idea, if we, um, again, going back to extremes, right. I, I eat too much and then I starve myself or, um, you know, I engage too much and then, and yes, digital detox and everything else. But this idea of if I'm going to go to the opposite extreme, um, as you said, either end, you're not in harmonic balance. You're, you know, you have to find this, um, um, this middle ground and you can't do that without awareness. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's, 
you know, I, I talk to a lot of audiences and I, and I don't doubt that there's people that sit out there in the audience with their arms kind of crossed and they're like, Shh, what she's talking about, this is not for me. Like, I'm totally fine. You know, I have balance in my life. I'm a badass already. I don't need any new skill sets. And the thing is, is that many of us only change through pain and suffering. And I like to think that I, I kind of plant a seed. And once kind of that enlightened awareness happens where people kind of realize, oh my gosh, like this, this isn't the right path or this is not, um, the most high performing way I can achieve my goals or they hit that, that burnout point. Um, I'd like to think that I kind of, at least they'll think back and say, Hey, I remember there, there, there is something for this. I can, you know, help myself. Um, through some self-care, through a focus on my own mindset and mental health um, so that I can stop it before it gets too damaging. Or if you already at, are at that damaged point, like you aren't afraid to seek help, you know, and get get some answers. But really, it's, it is. It's about that awareness. And a lot of us uh, shy away from it um, at times and, and won't see it until uh, it's like a self-necessity. And I think as this message starts to spread, we as service members want to help other service members. So yes, that person sitting in the audience with their arms crossed um, may not have self-awareness, but then they go home and they see their buddy or they see their friend um, and, and they're like, hey, you know, this guy, this gal said this, you might want to check into this. This is actually some research that has shown that um, veterans are more likely to encourage, encourage their fellow service members to seek therapy, whereas they will not do it themselves because they think others will judge them. And so um, that's another part of this planting the seed is our psychological shield covers our brother and our sister, um, and therefore our brother and sister's shield covers us. That's a great point. I, I like how you put that. Um, because I think with most of us in the military, we are, we are called to serve and, um, we do tend to kind of see that for others. You're right. And, and the last person is, you know, we don't see that for ourselves. Um, I wish more leaders would start to, and, and I think this is where my work was a little more unique when I was a commander is because I, I openly talked about these things. Um, I talked about love and connection and self-care and meditation, um, not as if it was this like fuzzy, hokey kind of thing, but that it's how it is the path to badassness, right? It is the way that we become high performing individuals and high performing teams and can fully connected with our families. And, you know, that was probably the best compliments I got from anyone that had worked for me at that, at that time was when they would tell me that it's not just making them better people, but it's changing their family dynamic. And that right there, when you talk about mental health and being, you know, focused and connected when you have like a very connected and committed tribe at home, you know, like that, no matter what your job is, you're going to be higher performing at it when you're not at work worrying and thinking about what's going on with your family. Well, that's absolutely true. Um, as I look through and, and uh, listeners know, we've done the um, Federal Mental Health Boot Camp and all the different challenges, both, um, you know, uh, clinical, but also transitional stress that veterans go through. The two things um, that I believe keep the veteran from going over the edge is if they have a stable family and they, and they're not, um, uh, struggling with some sort of addiction, right? All of the other things can be managed, right? The PTSD, the TBI, the depression, this purpose and meaning my, my grief and moral injury. Generally, all of those things can, can be handled if we have a stable network of support. And if we're not struggling with some form of addiction. Yeah, I believe that that's, that's, um, very true. Very true. That family unit is very important. And, you know, uh, the other thing we need, I think more examples out there of people that are um, not afraid to kind of, kind of vocalize and be open about their experiences. I know personally, as a veteran, I feel more connected, you know, having a therapist that's another veteran or, 
you know, kind of connecting still with my tribe. I think that's a lot of why my effort and work, you know, I I do work with civilian um, individuals and organizations, but I do love working with the military. And I think it's because it is right. We have this, this tribe feeling. um, We want to help each other. We want to serve and continue in that way. And I just wish that more leaders would create their cultures around kind of being okay to ask for help and using these types of what would be considered, and I'm using air quotes, unconventional leadership um, skill sets um, to kind of create their, the, the thread of who they are as individuals, and then kind of how you seamlessly integrate that into your leadership style to give other people the okay right? To go see the chiropractor even, or the mental health um, counselors, or to start meditating, right? Like right now, it's just weird, right? People still see it as like the odd thing to do. We're kind of like, uh, we're skeptical. And um, we just need more, I think, brave people to stand up and, and, and start talking about it openly. So I applaud you and a lot of your effort to kind of you know, pull back the curtain on veterans mental health and say, this is not uh, a negative thing. Like this is something that we need to be openly talking about in a positive light. Um, And, you know, my focus on prevention and performance is, you know, again, if we can attack it from the beginning, hopefully it'll be easier um, along the road. Yeah, I think that this may be one of the the good things, right? There's a a rainbow after every storm. Um, The idea of um, uh, this kind of focus on on wellness and strength and post-traumatic growth uh, coming from this sustained sympathetic surge, both individually and organizationally that we've had. Um, I'd like to give you an opportunity for you to share the audience with how you're doing that with your organizations and the work that you're doing um, uh, to be able to sort of make this shift in the conversation. Yes, it's um, my work is far from far from complete. Um, You know, as an individual, I uh, do consultation and I teach workshops um, with different organizations within the military. Um, Usually they're mindset and mindfulness focused, as well as we talk about recovery, you know, how important sleep is, nutrition, um, since my background is in a whole host of human performance factors, although mindfulness and mindset tend to be the most popular that I talk about. Um, I also just recently am really excited to announce a partnership with uh, Pete Carroll, the coach of the Seattle Seahawks, and Dr. Mike Gervais, who is a uh, world-class high-performance sports psychologist. And so the three of us are kind of combining our individual um, areas of focus. So Pete was one of the first to kind of introduce mindset um, connection and mindfulness into the NFL. Mike's been working with Olympians and world record holders and then my work within the military. So we're kind of combining our efforts to, and we've created a new workshop. It's an eight hour mindset training workshop that's performance based. And, you know, everything we teach is has either been through the lens of scientific research or that of being tested in alpha competitive environments. And so we teach an eight hour workshop. It's usually an elite military operator and an Olympian that teach the course. And then it's followed by an eight week digital training. Um, Individuals can also take the the eight week um, digital training, you know, in individual cohorts if they'd like. But uh, you can learn more about that at competetocreate.net um, or my website, which is just janellemccauley.com. And so that's kind of what we're hoping. You know, part of the issue with mindset is how do you integrate it into the culture and how do you scale it, right? How do you get each individual to be exposed to it? So our model is really if we teach the leaders to kind of be the mindset coaches, and then offer the digital training for, for the individuals so that they can, you know, because it is very individualized, as I'm sure you realize, this idea of self-discovery. And it's a journey. And we all need help on, you know, how we kind of uh, develop our guiding philosophies and who we are as individuals, because I think that's foundational, how we train mindfulness. And then how we train all the other aspects of our mindset from grit to control to focus to calm. Um, and once we kind of really get 
um, a good grasp on how to train our minds, I think ultimately it leads to better decision making. And I think that's really what we're we're after in the end, right? How do we make better decisions in stressful environments? And I think I would argue we all live in stressful environments today, so we could all use these um, skill sets. So yeah, so that's where the bulk of my work is is focused on today. I also am um, hoping to soon start working with school age children, um, kind of developing a physical and mental program to help them um, and learn how to emotionally regulate and also setting up positive habits from the beginning with respect to physical and mental exercise. Could you imagine if uh, you know, our our children were taught this from a young age. And, you know, I'm trying to get the military to integrate it at the beginning of a military career. But what if, you know, we had it as kids. So um, I'll, I'm also focusing on some of the work, that work as well. That's great. Hey, hey, I really appreciate you coming on the show today, Janelle. It was This was a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I was so excited to be here. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope you, you know, you continue your work with with veterans and kind of destigmatizing this idea of mental health because it is how we thrive um, as individuals, both in our performance as professionals, but also personally. So I commend you on your efforts and uh, support um, your continued work. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. You're listening to Headspace and Timing, where we're trying to change the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health. As with all of the episodes on the Headspace and Timing podcast, I hope you got a lot out of this one. I particularly want to bring your attention to the fact that Dr. McCauley is not a clinical mental health professional, but someone who's taken the time to learn and apply psychological concepts that we've talked about in this show and in others. Veteran mental health is not about being sick or broken. Avoiding having a real and honest conversation about what we experienced in the military and how it changed us does not perpetuate the stereotype, unless you think it does. And if you think talking about mental health perpetuates the stereotype, then you're not going to talk about it and thereby perpetuate the stigma. I also appreciate her openness about the struggles she experienced three quarters of the way through her career and the fact that her transition was difficult as well. None of us are immune to stress in our lives, but we can certainly manage the way we respond to that stress. Janelle is a great example of someone who deliberately applied mindfulness and a positive mindset to the stress in her post-military life and, like many others, wants to pass that along to her brothers and sisters who also served. Thanks for taking the time to listen. If you want to find the show notes for this episode, go to veteranmentalhealth.com forward slash HST125. If you want to show your support for the work that we're doing, make sure to leave an honest rating or review on your podcast player of choice. We're always looking for guests, either veterans or those who support them. You can drop me a line at info at veteranmentalhealth.com to recommend guests, or you can go to veteranmentalhealth.com forward slash guest to fill out a suggestion or request. I'm happy to announce that I've released a paperback version of the first Headspace and Timing book. It's been available on Kindle for a couple of years, but now you can get it along with Combat Vet Don't Mean Crazy. To check it out, go to VeteranMentalHealth.com forward slash HST book. Just a reminder that the guests and information on this show are for educational purposes only and not meant to be considered professional advice. While I am a practicing therapist, I'm not your therapist. If something you heard makes you think that you could talk to somebody, then reach out to do so. I'd like to thank Doc Todd for giving us permission to use his track, Not Alone, from his album Combat Medicine. Doc is trying to bring the discussion about federal mental health out of the darkness, and you can see all of his work at therealdoctod.com. Make sure to join us for the next episode. Hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice so you don't miss it. Until then, remember, veterans, you're not alone. Ever. The struggle is real. Found a feast and lost a soul. Eventually my drinking, it got out of control. There in darkness, I roam, struggling to find home. See, suddenly death didn't feel so alone. 22 a day, destination unknown. It could have been avoided. So I guess all we get is the tone Nothing but bone weeds overgrown Pushing up stones I've triumphed over enemies Co-creating enemies Broke out facilities That try to put an end to me R.I.P. I'd rather grind in tranquility Authentic Tennessee Embrace my ability Thank you.
love you guys. Take those bottles out, dog, and pour them in the sink. Take the needles out your arm and the gun away from your forehead. It's time, man. You've been through enough pain. Stand up. It's time to stand back up. All my veterans, man. Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. Get up. You know. 